As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son. And you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She'll give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. Thank you. You may be seated. Today, we're going to be talking on peace within myself. We started a series for this Christmas talking about peace on earth. And uh, today, we're going to talk about how the Lord wants to provide for us inner peace, peace within ourselves as we seek him. And then we're going to provide uh, three through his word. God gives us three key principles to help us access that special peace. There's a a mom, she was kind of at, it was toward the end of the Christmas season. And she was at this point kind of tied. She had last minute Christmas shopping to do and was now braving it through the malls. And she had three little ones in her in tow. And oh man, it was just a mad, mad, mad house, mad house trying to figure through and negotiate with everyone, try to keep all the kids in check and everything's cool, but not, oh, it's hard. And there's so many people and the hustle and bustle. And finally, she's trying to drag them into this elevator and it was already packed up with people and gets them in there. And she was like, oh man. She said, as the, as the door of the elevator closed, she said, you know, whoever thought of this Christmas stuff, as far as I'm concerned, they should arrest him, string him up, and kill him. So in the back of the elevator said, oh, don't worry. They already arrested him, hung him on a cross, and they killed him. Amen? Yep. What Christmas is truly is all about. But the holiday season, with all its stress, can be, can war against having peace within us, right? We can have this, we can, while it's supposed to be peace on earth, goodwill to men, in truth, we're fighting even having peace. And not only that, of course, we just live in a turbulent time, right, in our world. And all this can, the stress can add to that. It's not just, the holiday season, you think about this holiday season, and yet right now, as you know, in our country, and our, we're fighting inflation, and so it seems like we can get less for, I mean, yeah, we don't get less, we don't get as much for what we could pay for before, and we're all fighting that. I guess the inflation hasn't been this bad since the early 80s. It just won't, our just dollar just won't buy as much, and that can add to stress. You know what? I heard also, interestingly enough, with that financial stress, you might have heard this for, for decades now, the number one cause for divorce is money problems, right? 85% of all marriages that end in divorce, they say a major cause, and that the major cause is financial uh, stress. So obviously we're concerned for just marital uh, peace is a challenge right now, and get, having this inner peace in that. And of course, there's a lot of other things that can contribute to a lack of peace. We already know about, oh man, just this great political divide in our country and all of that could bring about. It's just, or just the thought about um, people now, it's, you know, it, it makes it harder to want to, you have your family gatherings to get together. What's that going to be like? And all, that, all this kind of thing, because you don't want stress to be in the relationship or even just the thought about having to deal with that can cause a lack of peace. And just add, of course, the just lack of other inner peace. It's just relate, just other relational worries or self doubt or shame, health concerns. Sometimes we don't even know what they are, and we can just start feeling down inside. We feel like we should be feeling up. We can just feel down. Job worries, all these kinds of things, can really war against having inner peace. Let me ask you, what tends to contribute to your lack of peace in your own heart? What, what tends to make you feel uneasy inside? 
Just think about your current situation right now. If you're, if you're tempted to give in to a lack of inner peace, or maybe you actually have given in to a lack of inner peace, what would be the contributing factors even the, or even the main cause? Now, as we previously stated, of course, this holiday season itself can cause a lot of stress or worry or fear or concerns about different things. So what tends to contribute to you personally feeling a lack of peace? I'll tell you, for me, it could be a number of things. I, like you, can feel that financial pinch, especially when the Christmas season, when it seems a lot more going out rather than coming in. Also, if you haven't noticed, I tend to become a people person. Yes, that is true. God knew what he was. He made me a pastor. I didn't know it, but he did. Because I like people. It's just something about that. I don't know. But because I like people, and, I, and in relationships are important to me, um, it can be hard when there's relational stress. Amen? Or, or you know, just the, the thought. I mean, I just... Think of family members and uh, what's it going to be like to see them or hope we're trying to. And it's like, golly. And you, people really make their thoughts known a lot of times on social media. It's like, what if I don't have that same view? And what's that going to be like? I don't want to deal with that. Maybe you can relate. Or, or what about, for me, it's even just, you know, my position is good. relationship is people oriented and and I don't like conflict, but sometimes that's just part of the human race. Conflict happens, watching folks and having to deal with that. And not always easy, but it, life happens. But all that can add to inner, a lack of inner peace. Just the stress of it all. That being said, whenever God had his angels appear during the Christmas stories, so often, more frequently, when he... When the angel, you know, was speaking to, to the shepherds or to Mary or Zechariah or Joseph. Often, like he said to the shepherds, he said, peace on earth, goodwill to men. Why? Why would it be peace on earth, goodwill to men? Because it had long been prophesied the Messiah of whom was going to be born. Isaiah wrote it 700 years before he was born. In Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. That among his four titles, it would culminate with him being the Prince of Peace. That he would be the source of peace to come. How? Well, last week we talked about that a little bit, right? Because we talked about there's different kinds of peace. And, he, and, and then when Christ came, he would bring about peace. And last week, we talked about the importance of, of how Jesus brought about peace between others. How did he do that? Well, through his death and resurrection, he broke down the dividing wall we talked about last week between Jews and non-Jews, Jews and Gentiles. And so that now all of us together can have a relationship with God, and we're all on the same level playing field. We're all in the same courtyard, so to speak, God's one courtyard, that we can come straight into the Holy of Holies because of what Christ has done for us. That puts us all the same. No more dividing wall. We're all equal. Equal before him. Peace. Inner peace. We, I mean, la, la, peace between others. We talked about that last week. Remember, we talked about the world will divide us, but Christ will unite us. Yep. But that's not the only peace, right? That, that God wants to bring through us to us through Christ. He wants to bring us inner peace as well. And I, I, that's what we want to focus on today. And I tell you what. I think that's the peace, I don't know, I, one that we crave so much. How I can be at peace and within my own heart. How can I have that inner joy? I mean, I, I, too often we let the world around us affect the peace within us, don't we? And that's why we're going up and down, up and down, peace, no peace, peace, no peace, peace, no peace. How do we have peace no matter what? God wants to provide that. He wants, to, he wants to give us that peace no matter what. We're going to look at that in a psalm today, Psalms 46. Just show how the, God really wants us through Jesus Christ to give us that inner peace. But first, just to give you, that, just to give you an exposure, we're going to look at two quick passages that demonstrate how God wants to provide us with great peace or inner peace in our own hearts today. God wants to grant us great personal 
peace. If you happen to have your program, you will notice there's a kind of fill in the blanks thing. And so we're going through that. Right now, let's look at Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. Isaiah is talking directly to God, and he says this, You, Lord, will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. Now, who keeps us some peace here? God does. God wants to grant us and keep us in peace. Now, interesting, look, look, taking a look at that type of peace that's described here. Now, it's in the Hebrew, right? Interestingly enough, in the Hebrew, it's written as, take a guess, shalom, 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 peace, peace. God wants to give you peace, peace. Now, they translate it just one peace. Why? Because that's what peace, peace means. It means God doesn't want to just give you peace. He wants to give you the peace of all pieces, the perfect peace. And that's why it says perfect peace, the ultimate peace. God wants to give you a peace, peace. Shalom, shalom. He wants to give the ultimate of pieces inside your heart. This time out within your heart. He wants to give it to you like crazy. And we're going to talk about how to do that. And so um, but we have to follow his prescription. Another passage. A lot of us have this memorized. I do. I love this passage. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, peace. (laughs) Well, he only says peace here, but yes. Which exceeds anything we can understand. That's why it's the peace, peace. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. The ultimate peace, the incomprehensible peace, the peace, peace, the, the, the perfect peace. Same thing. It's talking about the same concept. And the idea is the same. God wants to fill your hearts and minds with his perfect inner peace as we trust in him. Incomprehensible peace. Okay, great. So exactly what does this incomprehensible peace look like and how do we go about receiving it? And to answer these questions, we're going to look back into the book of Psalms. We're going to Psalms 46. Consider this the Christmas version of our Psalms for the Heart series. And so what we're going to do, we're going to look at Psalms 46, and we're going, to, we're going to see how God wants to give us this perfect peace. See, it was written during a time of great um, challenging challenges. It was a tumultuous period that this was written. So let's take a look at it right now, Psalms 46. Now, give you a background. Uh, it doesn't, and when we go through the Psalms 46, it doesn't tell us enough specifics to even know exactly when it was written. And that's purposeful. Because uh, it was written so, because it was written during a time of great, uh, tr- you know, tr- uh, difficulty. Because the, God wanted to communicate through his psalmist that no matter what you go through, and it's going to give us some general themes. God is there. He's there. No matter what you go, go through, no matter what your circumstances that you can face, God is still there. That's really the main point of the whole, of the whole psalm. He provides three general examples of when God is still there. So God is still there when? We'll look at first one, one. When it seems like our natural world is out of control. When our natural world is out of control. Look with me at Psalms 46, verses 1 through 3. God is our refuge and strength. Always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not fear when earthquakes come and the mountains crumble into the sea. Let the oceans roar and foam. Let the mountains tremble as the waters surge. This is describing natural disasters. Think floods, hurricanes, and oh yeah, tornadoes. Right? It's trying to think of the worst of the worst. Some of our people in our country have just suffered from that, right? In fact, as we think about it, can we pray for those families right now? Let's do that. Let's pray for the people who just had to endure the tornadoes. Father God, right now, Lord, thank you as we're reading in your word. You're there. Lord, even in the midst of great tragedy and natural disasters, you're there. And Father, we want to pray, Lord, first of all, for comfort for all those, Lord, have lost 
loved ones or even property or things. And Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would protect and that you would provide for them, that you would encourage them, support them. Lord, in fact, Lord, even in the midst of great tragedy, Lord, help them to see that you're there. Be there, Lord, in a powerful way because that's what your word says. So we trust you in that. Thank you, God, even the great tragedy and great, great turmoil, Lord. And the most difficult times, you're there. So be with them, Father God. Be their great support. Be their refuge and strength right now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God, though no matter what we go through, God is there. No matter what it is. You know, and that's what this is talking about. Everything, uh, whatever that might be, uh, natural disasters, whatever, diseases, ec- epidemics, we know all this, right? The point is, great natural disasters, hard times, God is there. Boy, do we need this for today, amen? And we need this for today. God is still there to be our help. Look at that verse one is the key part. We just, I'm not going to turn, if you want to go right back to verse one there, Mr. Greg, I just want to look them, have them look at verse one again. The point of that verse one of Psalms 46 is that God is there. He's our refuge and he's our strength. He's, look at, always ready to help in times of trouble. And so what's going to go on is the psalmist is now going to list all these different kinds of major troubles we could go through. And what he's going to be doing is he's going to show, he's, he's going to think of the ultimate ultimates. Things falling in the sea, go, world going crazy around us. The Natural disasters, that's the first thing. But the whole point is, but it's all dependent on verse 1. And then, and then it's a wonderful sandwich at the very end. It says, be still and know that I'm God. So they kind of form a perfect sandwich there. No matter what you're going through, the point is, it might feel like God isn't there. And isn't it true? When we're going through hard times, we wonder, where's God in that? And what the psalmist is saying here is, I'm here. I'm here. And I want to be there to help you. And I want to be there to support you. Just because you're going through it, and you are, the the point is you're going to go through it, but there's a place you can go to to find help and protection and support. It's God himself. And look at that he's that very present help. That's the translation I memorized, New American Standard. A very present help in times of trouble. And so whatever we're going through, natural disasters, God is there. Two, another place in time when God's still there. He's still there when we feel attacked or surrounded by chaos. And that's the next verses, 4 to 7. Psalms 46, 4 to 7. A river brings joy to the city of our God, the sacred home of the Most High. God dwells in that city. It cannot be destroyed. From the very break of day, God will protect it. The nations are in chaos. And their kingdoms are crumble. And God... Their kingdoms crumble, God's voice thunders, and the earth melts. The Lord of heaven's armies is there among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. Verse 6 describes when the storm is raging all around us, causing chaos, which can affect our personal world. It's when the situation just seems too big for us. It's when it just everything feels like you're spinning out of control. <laughs> Crime, right? Things that just seem like, what is going on? Chaos, right? That's what this is talking about here. And what it's saying is, even while everything seems like it's going out of control, God is still there. There's a place you can run to. It's God himself. This time of the city of God, where that is where God is located. We can run where God is, and that again, same what you read in verse 1, same idea. He becomes our refuge. And that place cannot be destroyed. Where God is, it cannot be destroyed. So you want to be in a place that's not going to be destroyed, you run to God. That's what this is saying. You can find safety and peace and security in him as your refuge. Because he's a very present help. And that's what he does. He's there when everything else is going crazy. He's not. He's the same. 
There's another way, another time when we feel like everything's going crazy. Is God there? Yep, God's there. He's there for natural disasters. He's there when everything around us seems like it's going out of control and chaos. Another time he's there. He's there when we face the threat of massive wars breaking out. See, here's the point. He's thinking of the worst of the worst. Now, I mean, we think about nuclear wars and crazy insanity or whatever, right? The worst of the worst. That's what he's trying to do. Same thing. But look what happens. God's still there and there. It's like, how? He is. Let's read Psalms 46, 8 to 11. Come, see the glorious works of the Lord. Look it. See how he brings destruction upon the world. He causes wars to end throughout the earth. He breaks the bow and snaps the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I'll be honored by every nation. I'll be honored throughout the world. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. Even during the time of the greatest possible military calamity, the thing is what it's saying here is through those times. Now, I mean, this is amazing. I mean, he wrote this 3,000 years ago. And yet, maybe it's different some, you know, little parts, but the concepts are all the same. We still deal with it today, do we not? More than ever, right? More than ever. Well, we're here, what's going on right now with this last week, right? The threat of Ukraine and Russia and... There's always the idea, of what's going to happen? Is China going to invade Taiwan? And all that kind of stuff. Or other things we don't even know about. And the threat of worse... And this whole point is, God says, hey, I know you're going to be dealing with that. I want you to know what, know this, no matter what you go through. The thing, and it says, think God's saying, think of the worst of the worst. Worst of natural disasters. Worst of chaos. This, you know, the world around you is spinning out of control. Think of the worst of wars. He goes, still, I am there. How? How? Well, did you catch it? Even when we're hearing about all these things going on. The point is, God was still there. The psalmist is he's talking about God was still going to be he's going to rule over all. He's still our refuge and our strength. He's still a very present help in times of trouble. It's you want the inner peace, you got to go to the source of the inner peace. Right. It's not automatic. Amen. But he wants to give it to you. The psalmist in our passage says, God wants to give you that. For me, when I think of people who are desperately in need of inner peace, and we, what we do with our inner, and just our own hearts, I, I remind of Joseph. We read Joseph as our inner pastor. Just remember what it must have been like for him, right? When he gets word that this woman that he was betrothed to, to be, you know, for, to live with as his wife for the rest of his life, and finds out that she's pregnant, and he knows he's not the dad. <laughs> Okay, so what am I going to do about this? The Bible says that um, he didn't want to embarrass her. He was a righteous man, but he didn't feel like he could marry her either. So he was going to divorce her privately, not to call it cause her public disgrace. If that happened, she could, she could have been stoned to death for that. He didn't want that to happen to her. But think about this. How much, how do you think he was feeling inside when he's getting the news? He's reasoning back and forth. What's he going to do? I mean, he was, the man was no doubt in tremendous pain, right? He wasn't a mark of peace. Completely unsettled and worried. And what do I do? And back and forth. And they, while he's wrestling about what to do, the good news was even in now that his, when even though he, he probably was marked by a lot of lack of peace, God was still there. The Lord knew, knew his unease and his, his thoughts, and so God sent him an angel to tell him, Hey, Joseph, don't worry. She's praying because the Holy Spirit, she's still a virgin, the Holy Spirit took, overtook her, and she was able to, be, to conceive. That's from God himself. So you go, don't be afraid to take her as your wife. You name him Jesus. He's going to set. People, he's going to deliver people from their sins. Jesus, Yeshua, je, deliver our Savior from our sins. That's what that means. And so that's what. And so he did it. He, when he woke up, he obeyed the angel, and 
And after that, his tremendous lack of peace was replaced by a tremendous amount of peace and joy, no doubt. He's going to still have the woman of his dreams. And that's how God is there for us today. He wants to be the source of our peace. How? What does that look like? We're going to take a look at our Psalms 46 passage and some corollary passage, passages, and we're going to come up with three principles that God wants to provide for us for this inner peace, how we can access this inner peace. You really want to have it? Because here's the deal. I'm going to be blunt with you for a moment here. <laughs> I, and I can relate to this because Lonnie's been guilty of this. When we go through it, sometimes you're like, God, where are you? Why am I so unsettled here? Why am I so stressed out? Why can't I sleep in the middle of the night? Well, the answer, Lonnie, is it's here. You're just not accessing it. Right? He has it. He's making it available. We already said that God's there no matter what we're going through. Okay, well, what's his principles? Go back to Psalms 46. Here are the three key principles to access God's peace. And the first one is, principle number one is, God's promises. This is the promise. That he's always going to be there when we're facing turmoil if we'll run to him. Him, nobody, not someone else. Him. Psalms 46.1, God's our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. The key is, and that's the foundational statement, the whole point is, this verse 1 is foundational for all. Remember, we talked about this. The reason why he's talked about, I list all those great possible tragedies and turmoil in the world was, it's all depend on verse 1 here. And that is, but God's still our refuge and strength. No, he, what he's doing, the psalmist is saying, he's testing the limits. Think of the worst thing that could happen. And he, he does that. No, I want to think of natural disaster, utter complete chaos. The world's going insane. Oh, and by the, yeah, I mean, we're talking all natural disasters, all natural ep epidemics, all these terrible things, total chaos, everything going around. Oh, yeah, wars. Don't forget about terrible wars, all that. But still, there's God. He's there with you. If we'll run to him. That's the key, though. He's our refuge, the place of fine protection. God's our refuge. Ready and available to be accessed. If we'll run to him and take the peace he promises. But we have to run to him. He's not going to force himself on anyone, folks. If it's because I'm uneasy about something, it's because I'm not thinking about him. I'm thinking about the thing I'm uneasy about. Hello? Right? Come on. But he promises that peace. We know this. Okay, John, I'll read more for one verse and we'll refer it again. John 14, 27. From Jesus' own mouth here, this is what Jesus said. I am le I'm leaving you with a gift, Jesus said. Peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. What gift is Jesus promising to give us? Look at it. What is it? Peace of mind and heart. Inner peace. That's what he's talking about. And he promises to give it to you. And he says it's a gift. But we have to choose to receive it. Think about Peter. See, Jesus got permission. He's walking on water. All good. His eyes are on Jesus. All of a sudden, he realized, well, wait a minute. Right wave and wind and world chaos. That kind of thing. And now he's focusing on that stuff. Instead of Jesus, what happens? That's when he sinks, right? Because he got his eyes off of Jesus. The problem with when you and I are lacking peace is because our eyes are on the waves and the wind and the chaos around us and the problems that beset us 
rather than the God who gives us peace and works in the midst of it all. Principle number two. And this is the key principle of this message. So don't get this one, please. Peace follows where trust leads. Can you say that with me, please? Peace follows where trust leads. A little bit better than that. Peace follows where trust leads. Principle, this is key. In our, one of the verses we looked at, we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 26, we'll look at verse 3, but we're also going to look at verse 4. So God promises he's going to give us his perfect peace, the shalom, shalom, the peace, peace, right? But look at the context here. We have to trust him. Isaiah 26, 3 and 4. You will keep in perfect peace, 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 all who trust in you. All whose thoughts are fixed on you. Hmm, hearing a constant refrain here. Look at this, verse 4. Trust in the Lord always, for the Lord God is the eternal rock. That word trust is key. Peace follows where trust leads. He's promising us perfect peace. Peace, peace. The ultimate of peace. How? We got to trust in him. And reality, he mentions two, two parts, right? Two parts to get this perfect peace. One is to get their eyes fixed on him. That's what we're talking about. Like Peter. Eyes on Jesus, good. Eyes off of Jesus, bad. Eyes were no longer fixed on him. That's the first part. Second part is trust. Trust. When Peter got his eyes off of Jesus, he got it, he, his trust went away too. You know where his trust went? On the wind and the waves. The circumstances. But when he got his eyes back on Jesus, well, of course, Jesus, Lord, save me. And he did. Boom. He's our refuge and strength. Very present help to times of trouble. So, we have to trust. Peace follows where trust leads. Uh, same, same concept. So, I, this, I just want to help you. When you're feeling unrest and hurt and you know, uneasy inside, that means your eyes are off, off on something else and not on God. That's what that means. This is also seen in our, my, one of my favorite verses we looked at earlier, Philippians 4, 6, and 7. It's saying the same thing. Let's take a look at it. Don't worry about anything. This is when you're tempted to feel worried, tempted, uneasy. Instead, pray about everything. You're running into God in hours. You're fixing your eyes on him. Tell God what you need and thank him. There's the trust part. You can't thank God unless you're really trusting him. Thank him for all he has done. Then you'll experience God's peace. Perfect peace. Peace, peace. Which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Peace follows where trust leads. Paul is saying, as you're in your situation, you're tempted to feel worried about it. You're looking at the wind of the waves. Everything's bad. With chaos. Whatever's going on. I can't believe what's going on in my family. But my mom, whatever it is. Oh, no. What we do is catch people. Because we're looking at the wind and the waves and everything else, but the one person we need to be looking at. And our trust is not in him, it's in something else. And by the way, those other things are like a water. You sink. Right? Sherry and I were talking. Let me tell you something. I'm a news fan. I, I shouldn't tell a news fan. I'm not a fan of news. But I'm a news freak. I read a lot of news. And it's like, I'm done with that. That's like looking at the winds and the waves. You know what I mean? It's like, look at the wind and the waves. I don't need to hear any more of that garbage. I want him alone. Think about the Christmas story. The wise men. I mean, think about the inner turmoil there. They know where to go. But they were trusting God. God had revealed to them a star in the east. We don't even know how far away they were, but it was a long ways away. And they knew it was God, and so they decided to take this long trek. Most people think it was months. Some people could set up to close to a couple of years because of when Harry decided how many how young the children were that he was going to kill. But anyways, anyways, at least months. And when they, when they finally got there, they, they, they no longer saw the star. They didn't know where the star was. I don't know where it stopped. I don't know. It doesn't say. So they went to Jerusalem and asked. 
The point is they were acting in faith. They went as far as they could, and then they still trusted God to say, okay, um, we know there's a king of Israel going to be born around here somewhere. Help us, guide us. What do we do? And that's when they find, well, that's when King Herod's priest said, well, actually, the Bible says he's going to be born in Bethlehem. Okay. So they went to Bethlehem. And when they're getting out there, they're trusting, acting in trust again. All of a sudden, God causes them to see a what? There's that star again. And that star leads them right above the house where Jesus was little. Jesus was located. That must have been some star. And so they follow that star. But you can imagine, said, when they saw the star, they were filled with great joy. I'm sure with that joy, there was a lot of peace. Because where trust leads, I mean... Yeah, peace follows where trust leads. Yes, same idea. Peace follows where trust leads. And sometimes even like God, joy too. I know time is getting, so we need to finish up here, so we will. Last principle. Principle three. God will work in the situation. Oh, this is what we want to hear, isn't it? God will work in the situation that tempts to stress us. I, I, I'll be honest with you. I love Philippians 4, 6, and 7. We already looked at it. One of the, fir- the first two verses I decided to memorize when I decided to truly follow Jesus on my own. But, as much as I liked it, I said, okay, Lord, thank you for the peace, but what about the thing I'm concerned about? <laughs> That's principle number three. Yes, God is going to work in that too. God will work in a situation that tempts us to stress. If we seek him, he'll give us, he'll fill us with his perfect peace, but he'll also work in his perfect way. That's the last two, ver- that two verses, of Psalms 46, 9 and 10, two of the last verses. This is my God, God, he causes wars to end throughout the earth. He breaks the bow and he snaps the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He be still, God saying, and know that I am God. I will be honored by every nation. I will be honored throughout the world. Now, interestingly enough, I didn't know some, some translations actually say, be at peace. But, that's interesting. But, the peace he's talking about here isn't so much the inner peace. Here, God's talking to the nations that are at war with each other. He's saying, you know what? Knock it off! Okay, Lonnie translation. That's basically what he's saying, though. I looked it up, the word. It said, be calm, be at rest. Hang it, you know. Okay, another one. Chill out! That's a better one. And again, God's saying, I'm going to make it right. What's the point? The point is, yes, if I go to him, he's my refuge and my strength. He's going to protect me. He's going to take care of me. He's going to give me the peace that I need so I'm not so worried inside. And he's actually going to work in the situation I'm concerned about as well. Woohoo! He's not some Pollyanna saying, oh, just feel better about things. <laughs> he really will work in the situation. And here's the, here's the neat thing. This is a promise that we, so many of us have memorized. Let's think about it, the implications here. Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes, look at this, everything to work together for the good of who? Of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. In other words, if you love God and you're trying to follow his will for your life, he's going to work your situation, always work your situation out for your good. Not, it's this, the cool thing about this is, it's not tomorrow God's working this out for his good. It's all, first of all, every, God always works it out. He's ultimately the ultimate good. But this is saying, because of his love for you, he's working out your situation for your good. That's a promise. That's a promise. So whether you see it or not, that great song I love, The Waymaker, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. I would try to sing it, but you would go, ah! (laughs) That's what he's doing. He's working in your situation for your good, for your betterment. That's an awesome promise. But regardless, how his timing is different, and how he works is different, and, and, and his purposes are different, but he's always working out for your betterment. He chooses, the reason why he says no to your plan B is because his plan is be- A is better than your plan B. 
Some years back, when my family was in great turmoil and stress, I'm going to share it with you. Probably was, I experienced what I think is the best Christmas I've ever had in my whole life. Uh, Sherry and I, I've shared this before, I'm not going into details, and I couldn't even begin to go into details. We adopted a child that put our family through great, great personal duress. And one of those time periods was going, it was in the Christmas season. And it was very difficult. I can't underscore that enough. He, he has, even to this day, has great mental health challenges. And it was just very difficult. But Sherry and I were still determined to make that Christmas special somehow for our family. And my, I mentioned recently about my friend Ray and his wife Lori, who had a, um, a ministry to help clothe the homeless people in Seattle. I mentioned that recently. And so they often, what they would do, Ray and Lori, is they would make a point on Christmas morning early uh, to clothe, with nice clothes, homeless people. And Sherry and I decided, you know what? We're going to help Ray and Lori with their ministry on Christmas morning. But we're not going to cheat our kids out either. So, was, but we want them to learn how it is to love and serve other people at the same time. And so what we're going to do is we're going to wake up really early. Three in the morning early. That's early for me. My dad has a joke. I'm totally off car here. My dad always says, you know what? Three in the morning comes really early. You say, what? Are you getting up at three? No, no, but it really comes really early. That's my dad joke. He always says that kind of thing. But anyways, well, we actually got up three in the morning. And we opened up presents. I'll tell you what. It was a lot easier for our kids to do that than us. But that's okay. We did it. And then we were still able to take off and go to Seattle about 45 minutes away from where we lived. Downtown. And help with the homeless. Giving them clothes. Other things that they needed. All donated in the name of Jesus. And that part we knew would be difficult for our son. But we did it anyways. We helped him through it. And then afterwards our family went to Denny's. Nothing special. But I'm going to tell you something right now. That after we went help with the homeless and then we went to Denny's and we were all of our family to open up our presents we hung out at Denny's and we had the most laughter and the most joy and the most peace I mean we were just having a good time hanging out I don't know I could I don't I can't explain it to you I don't know why but it was special and it was real and it was you could feel it and none of us wanted to leave and it wasn't because nice food but it wasn't because of that it was because of who we were with each other with and I think it was because of what we had just done in the name of Jesus so God had granted us this peace we acted in faith you see peace follows where trust leads peace follows where trust leads